Airing on Asheville FM 103.3 LPFM in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian broadcasts and podcast emanating out of occupied Chalagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world, and you can find our archives, transcripts, ways to follow us and support us at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org. This week, we're sharing two interviews. First up, Ian spoke with Alec Dunn and Josh McPhee, editors of the recently released issue number eight of Signals, a journal of international political graphics and culture out from PM Press. Then you'll hear a conversation with imprisoned new African revolutionary socialist Mwalimu Shakur, currently incarcerated at Corcoran Prison in California, about abolition, political education, and the hunger strikes of 2013 in which he participated. Check our show notes at our website alongside the full interview that won't fit into the radio broadcast for how to find his writings or get in touch with M. Walimu, as well as a link to our past chat with him and the interviews we recorded during those hunger strikes with the likes of Ed Mead of California Prison Focus. But first, a couple of announcements. Join Blue Ridge Anarchist Black Cross on the first Sunday of each month Next up being August 6th from 3 to 5 p.m. at the new Firestorm Spot at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville. It's across the street from Odd, the bar. And Blue Ridge ABC will be set up for prisoner letter writing from 3 to 5 p.m. as they are the first Sunday of every month. And be excited the next week. This will be one of the venues, as will the odd, as will Different World be the venues for the 2023 Another Carolina Anarchist Book Fair or ACAB 2023. Uh, if you visit acabookfair.noblogs.org, you can find a list of the presentations and speakers and workshops that are going to be going on from Friday, August 11th through Sunday, August 13th, all free, open to the public, as well as you'll find vendors who are going to be at the craft fair on Sunday at the Odd Bar and bookstalls, like who's going to be tabling as booksellers and um, local community projects at Different World uh, during the book fair portion of things. So there's a ton of stuff. The main speakers are going to include a presentation on the history of anti-racist action organizing featuring Shannon Clay, the co-editor of We Go Where They Go from PM Press, who I interviewed for the show a month and a half ago or so, uh, as well as Joe Nina and Lorenzo Irvin, former Black Panthers and foundational voices to Black autonomism and Black anarchism, as well as a member of the original Jane Collective out of Chicago, and a whole bunch of other really fascinating historical and contemporary political figures. I definitely suggest taking a look at the social media and the website to find out how you can join up and help out and participate in this historic series of events. It's going to be fantastic. Also, new African revolutionary elder and acupuncturist and former political prisoner, Dr. Matulu Shakur, joined the ancestors at age 72 earlier this month. He was released by the state after 36 years in prison, organizing, healing, educating, and inspiring despite having developed a virulent bone cancer and being in on some BS charges in the first place. Dr. Shakur spent the last year on this planet continuing his work, speaking and attending events, surrounded by loved ones, rest in power. Also, also, politicized prisoner and jailhouse lawyer Rochelle Sinkyu McGee is slated to be released after 67 years in the California prison system. Sinkyu is 84 years old, arrested on an indeterminate sentence around a marijuana charge in 1963. He joined the attempted jailbreak at the during the Marin County Courthouse shootout, in which Jonathan Jackson attempted to free William A. Christmas and James McLean. Rochelle was the sole survivor and was co-defendant with Angela Davis until their cases were split. There's a fundraiser to support St. Q's post-release uh, needs as he's an elder. That's linked in our show notes on fundraiser.com. And uh, also in the show notes, you can find a link to a pertinent article as well as an interview that uh, I was able to conduct with St. Q a couple of years ago about his case. 
Next up, an update to past announcements on Kevin Rashid Johnson of the Revolutionary Intercommunal Black Panther Party, incarcerated revolutionary as he is. The public pressure from calls and emails apparently had the desired results, and as of a few days ago, he was receiving his medical treatment that he needs for his prostate cancer. Though he hasn't received all of his papers back from the authorities who flipped his cell, Uh, So he's having trouble continuing to pursue the lawsuits against the Virginia DOC that he was working on, um, thanks to those confiscations. But he is super thankful for the public engagement to defend his health. More updates on his case can be found at RashidMod.com, R-A-S-H-I-D-M-O-D.com. Thanks for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, Would you mind introducing yourselves and giving your preferred pronouns as well as any affiliations you think might be relevant to our conversation? My name is Alec Dunn. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm one of the co-editors of Signal, a journal of international political graphics and culture, as well as a member of the Just Seeds Artist Collaborative. And my name is Josh McPhee. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm also a co-editor of Signal with Alec. I'm also a member of Just Seeds Artist Cooperative. And I'm part of a project here in Brooklyn, New York, uh, called Interference Archive, which is a public-facing archive of the culture and material produced by social movements. Um, Can you tell the listeners about your uh, respective backgrounds as it relates to this kind of work? Sure, I'll go first. I mean, I think that both both Alec and I kind of came up in the do-it-yourself punk scene and subculture and were politicized through that. I got my start making sort of applied art design and, and graphics by, by working with bands um, and people in the, in the punk scene doing t-shirt designs and record covers and flyers for shows and then, you know, tattoo designs and, and other kinds of things. Um, uh, then, got involved in self-publishing and uh, zine publishing. And then a lot of the skill sets sort of born out of that dovetailed into very similar parallel work, but with community and social justice organizations, uh, which is where a a lot of the, the cultural work that I do now is focused. I don't really have a lot to add there. So I'll just say probably the same thing. I think Josh grew up, well, I know Josh grew up in Boston and spent time in um, DC and Ohio. And I grew up on the West Coast in Portland and maybe there's regional differences and had spent time in New Orleans. But I think both of us got um, basis for design out of being around uh, music scenes and punk especially. And But I'm, I think both of us were always doing political graphics. I mean, I think even when I was in teenager in high school and I mean they were crude and I wouldn't want anyone to see them necessarily but um, it's been a long interest and hobby and passion. Okay I believe based on my research that Just Seeds has been around for around 25 years at this point. Can you tell me a little bit about the evolution of the project and um, at this point can you talk about what exactly Just Seeds encompasses in terms of of the work that you all do. Following up on on some of these background questions, starting in the mid 1990s, I and a, a lot of people who who were doing similar work to to what I was doing started producing material for different movements. And the context back then, 30 years ago, was particularly the the economic context was really different. And most of the organizations that I was working with had very, very small budgets and sort of a focus on art and culture was not really part of the program. And so they were interested in, and I worked with groups to design posters and t-shirts and, and things like that, but there was rarely much money to pay for those things. And so I started getting paid in material. So I would design a poster for an organization and they would give me a hundred posters and I would design a t-shirt for a march or a rally and I would get a stack of t-shirts. Um, and then while doing that work, I was making kind of parallel uh, work on the side around similar issues around 
mass incarceration in the United States, around housing, around solidarity issues internationally, anti-war. And starting in 1997, 1998, I um, realized that like it would be really nice to actually be able to make some portion of a living doing doing this work rather than just working a day job. Or at the time, I actually worked, often I worked an overnight job uh, at a copy shop, which was called Kinko's, which was sort of a central hub for both zine culture and punk culture and lots of different uh, music subcultures and political self-publishing. But rather than just sort of doing those things, it would be nice to actually make part of a living doing doing the work that I loved. And so I started making these paper catalogs that um, started out as just one sheet of paper and then became little stapled together um, catalogs that had pictures of the T-shirts that I had and the posters um, and things. And, and I started mailing them out to everyone that I knew, physical mail. So I, you know, would get a, a list of addresses and I would send these things out to everyone and they would all have like a little, um, form that you could cut out that where you would check a box. Uh, I want this poster or this shirt and you'd stick a $10 bill, um, into an envelope and mail it to a PO box in Chicago that I had. And that's basically how just seed started. Um, there were, you know, I would get like an order every month, every couple of weeks. Hey, I'd like this t-shirt. Here's 10 bucks. Um, I'd like this poster. Here's five bucks. And I would, you know, put them in the mail and send them out. And then, uh, not only did people start ordering things and, and that picked up so that it went from being an order a month to an order a week to an order a day, but also people who were doing very similar work to that, to what I was doing, started contacting me and saying, Hey, will you help me sell my stuff? And, um, Alec was one of those people. There were a number of other people that all became the, the central um, hub of, of Just Seeds when we became a cooperative in 2006. Can you talk a little bit about what you attribute the longevity of the cooperative to? Have you found there to be any uh, major major cons of, your, you know, or, or negative qualities to working in a cooperative? But I'm kind of drawing a blank. What has made the cooperative have some longevity? And I know that that is a real thing i mean someone had called this the last legacy activist project of the 90s that was still going which was kind of embarrassing or i don't know early 2000s anyway what does it i think partly you know we're geographically dispersed so you know that is a big disadvantage and also a little bit of an advantage in that um you know some of the kind of wear and tear of being around each other i guess you know everything i would say i would see as a both an advantage and disadvantage so geographically dispersed we're not always up in each other's shit to put it bluntly you know let's see or cooperative we're not you know we do do collective decision making and we're still kind of an evolving process 20 years later on how to decide these bigger issues with the group but in general we have a kind of loose once again, for better or worse, set of values that we work around and do try and have a lot of trust with each other as far as cooperative projects and not everyone having to be involved with everything all the time. Certainly some tensions have arisen at various times and we're not strictly ideological. We cover probably a wide swath of left politics from liberal to revolutionary at times and people, you know, express different political views. And I think there's, that has also been something of an advantage. We've, I think at various points have talked about trying to make points of unity between us. And I think in some ways our longevity is that we haven't had a really strict ideological boundaries that we draw ourselves around. Okay. Pivoting a little bit to the topic at hand, PM Press just published issue number eight of Signal. It is a decade plus project for you guys. Is that correct? Um, yeah. 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 For 12 years now. Or okay. I think we sort of conceptualized it in 2008, 2009, and then the first issue came out in 2010. Can you talk about the origins, the initial intentions, and maybe how your 
considerations and goals have changed over the course of, of, of its life? Sure. Both Josh and I had been fans of political art, especially from other countries. And it was, uh, you know, especially around the time we were starting out, could be difficult to find. So I think we both had spent a good amount of time in libraries and looking at the foreign language section of used bookstores for art books and old Eastern Bloc catalogs, things like that. I mean, we both had kind of accrued similar interests and knowledge. And a lot of the stuff was fairly big, but there was not any, like a lot of the things we were interested, I would say, are, were fairly well known, but there was not a lot published at the time and certainly not a lot in print. So I'm talking about things like the Taller de Grafica Popular, which was a Mexican print collective that started in the 1930s. Atelier Populaire, which was the kind of loose name for young printmakers following the May 1968 uprisings in France. Russian constructivists, German expressionists. I mean, all that stuff, I think, is almost like canonical at this point. But at the time, you had to dig pretty deep to find stuff about Leopold Mendez or Elizabeth Catlett. So I think, you know, we both kind of were big fans of that, as well as most of the other printmakers we knew. And Josh and I just got a little bit nerdier about trying to draw connections and look for stuff. So we talked about wanting to do a publication. And I think we both felt there was a lot to learn from previous graphical movements. There was so much richness there and in the scene that you know, we had that just seats kind of came out of and that we'd come out of, it was a fairly barren environment. And I, you know, we felt a little bit, I don't know, messianic or something about trying to infuse more art into that world. And I think also I'm trying to think of just like, you know, Ospal, the Cuban group had so much color and life and it was such a different graphic language. And we were both very influenced by, um, work that was being sent to Josh from a friend of ours in Japan of like Japanese political graphic design, which just seems to have a totally different uh, basis and format and structure and just a very different aesthetic and feeling like those things could help us in the U S kind of expand the idea of what we think is possible and kind of enrich also our graphic palette. I think, so that was kind of the, beginning and i think josh should probably pitch in here as well what i think is interesting is i think originally we talked about trying to do stuff that was focused on international political art with the idea of having a u.s based audience and i think over time what we found is we actually have a fairly large international audience i don't know what it would be as a breakdown i mean i know probably it's still mostly u.s but it feels like a lot of the interaction we get from people and email and feedback is mostly from international people when you say what's possible, are you are you talking in terms of design or from a political perspective? I think both. And I think from design and also from the role of a designer or artist or what have you, creative worker within a political movement. And that, you know, as Josh had noted there, when Just Seeds had started, when he had started doing art, like late 90s, early 2000s, the role of the artist was very pushed to the side. Oh, yeah, make a poster and, you know, maybe it would the image you made would be shrunk down and thrown in the corner or pixelated or, you know, whatever. And so seeing that the prominent role and freedom and resources that people had in political movements the world over or that they created was inspiring and very different than how uh, creative work was treated in political struggles in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to sort of paint a picture, so to speak, in the mid to late 90s, if you went to a demonstration in the United States, the the most common thing that you would probably get handed would be an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper that was filled on both sides with 10 point type. And maybe there'd be a corner of like a child who had been bombed or something uh, in a little image. Um, things were were type heavy. They were visually not particularly nuanced. And then if you were coming from a more anarchist or anti-authoritarian perspective and you were a maker like like Alec and I, like people would get upset if you used anything other than red and black. 
um, there, there were there were really strong conventions around what was sort of acceptable and readable as political in this way or that way. And I think that neither of us were really interested in that. And we felt that it it not just harmed the visual culture, but it but it actually made the politics not particularly attractive. And so we were really interested in trying to like look at examples from history and around the world when other kind of visual regimes existed. So the thing that strikes me, uh, you know, from initially taking a look at Signal um, is how, I guess, deeply considered everything is. Um, can you, from a design perspective, I mean, can you discuss some of the design choices you've made over the course of the publication and what have informed them? A few things that struck me in the latest issue, for example, were your use of landscape images situated ver vertically and that odd numbered pages had block text while even numbered pages had the text in columns. Um, to, the, to my point, I guess, what did you want Signal to be and what did you not want it to be? I think you kind of touched on this prior, but maybe a little deeper into it. I mean, I think that from the get-go, the the project has always, Signal has always had this sort of primary tension at its core, which is the desire, our desire to, to give space and voice to all of these different kinds of images and, and histories and narratives. And at the same time, work within the limits of what was possible with the kind of publishing that we had access to. I mean, PM has been amazingly generous and has facilitated this project now for over a decade. But part of the, the ability for us to pitch and even get this project started was to, to say we're going to have to do something relatively small. It's five by seven. It's not a, each, each one is not a coffee table book. They're pocket sized um, because that's what we could afford to do. That's what PM had the capacity to print in full color and that, you know, limited page count. And so it's always been this, this interesting tension. The design is really driven by a desire to push as much into each issue as possible, but at the same time, try to give each feature its own space both so that it's readable but also so that the images are able to breathe so people can take some time with them and i mean some of the things like taking a horizontal image and turning it on its head so that it's it's vertical some of that is space we can if you make it vertical you can make it bigger because the publication is vertical but some of it is also just sort of trying to upturn traditional conventions so that the eye has to sort of turn a little bit to, to look at something a little differently to get people to, to sort of engage in a way that is different than when you just pick up a standard trade paperback and go page by page. Um, do you approach each issue as a new concept or are you trying to kind of create continuity across iterations? I mean, we have some continuity and we ha definitely have some formats that we import issue to issue. And some of that you noted with the columns versus the blocks of text and things like that. A lot of that is, you know, probably even a little bit unconscious, but there's a way that I probably in my head at this point developed how Signal looks. You know, we use a similar font to read that we find to be very readable at a small size. Um, so there is some design continuity we do try and do a new design for each article and each issue and as far as you know making a conscious choice of what's going to be in an issue and whether that balances out there's that doesn't happen at all so we're really often hemmed in i mean we might have an article that we hold back from an issue for space or or for whatever reason and you can kind of place that in a later issue when you want to but for the most part we're mostly dependent on contributors and on time and getting things in. And so each issue ends up a little bit accidental. And I think, you know, especially even when we had the f just one issue out, I think, you know, there was good response to it, but people could say, well, this is kind of a hodgepodge of articles. And I think now with eight issues and the ninth coming and 10th coming after that, I mean, you start seeing them as a collection and I think it creates a, 
kind of interesting uh, tapestry or mosaic of idea about what political art can be and how it how how art is used in social movements and political struggles around the world. So to answer your question, is there anything deliberate about it? No, it's pretty random, issue to issue. Although Josh and I both have probably ideas about what fits in the magazine as a whole and what doesn't. And those can be very broad ideas. And I would say probably, you know, one thing I think, which I think we were more probably open to in the beginning, but probably less interested in now, and that's not across the board. I mean, we still have fine art in there, but we're less interested in things that appear in galleries or are conceived as fine art or art projects that are political and more interested in applied arts, meaning things like, you know, design, illustration, printmaking, sculpture, that are meant to be used by activists or movements directly. I mean, I, I think that it's also important to point out that it maybe it's changed a little bit over the past decade, but when we started it, and I think it's still largely true now, that this place that we're locating our interests, which is the intersection of social movements and cultural production, is not one that there's a lot of writing about. And in particular, like the writing tends to fall either into the heavily academic realm in which you'll have like a highly theoretical volume about a very specific time and place in which uh, something like this happens. So, you know, the role of pirate radio in the Quebecois national struggle from 19... 72 to 1975 or something or you have kind of when we were starting out you'd have like zine articles like people who were interested in things and just did a did a teeny bit of research and wrote a little thing about something and now the equivalent of that i guess is sort of blog posts that exist about some of these things and we were really interested in trying to find a space in between those that we're interested in writing that is accessible to a general audience and particularly to the kinds of people that make this culture, but that's serious. That isn't just a, a kind of toss off paragraph to, to put with a handful of images, but actually is considered and takes into account the context in which material was made and the kind of impacts it potentially had and, and, that that sort of sweet spot of writing is hard to find. And that's part of why we, we tend to be like the table of contents is decided as we're putting an issue together, because we're not drawing on this massive well of 500 articles that have been submitted. We're kind of scrambling to try to get people to, to get us material and, and to find the things to cobble together an issue because there just has not been a, support for that kind of populist but engaged writing around culture and politics, at least not in the United States. Can you speak to publications or design philosophies, whether they are mainstream or, you know, of the, of the niche, I guess, activist variety um, that kind of have influenced the way you are putting this together? I mean, it's, it's certainly its own distinctive thing, but I mean, I think that you can also make the case that Signal is part of a, a lineage, so to speak. Well, I would say as far as where it exists on the landscape of current graphic design, you know, it's a journal, it's not a book. So there's things that we carry over between issue, each issue, and in that way, uh, we are not like many other journals. So a lot of journals have a very set um, design pattern that they use certain typography or the way that they box in images or don't have images at all often. I was thinking of that there were some weekly publications that do do some innovative stuff in graphic design. Okay. I don't know. Josh, you should go for it. I'm okay. just <laughs> I mean, I was just thinking like uh, maybe just to tell a story. Like when I was 19, I went into a bookshop in Washington, D.C., a used bookshop and kind of buried in a pile of old books, I found this copy of the Sinfuegos Press Anarchist Review, 
uh, the fourth issue, I think, um, which was this Sin Fuegos Press was this British anarchist publication publishing house that existed in the 1970s and into the early 1980s. And they did this anarchist review, which in at its peak, third, fourth, kind of fifth issues, it was this kind of oversized, maybe nine by 12 inch dense packed 200 page 250 page kind of compendium catalog of kind of all things anti-authoritarian and i i've carried that book with me the rest of my life and part of it is that it's just chock full of so many little things that you can pick it up it's one of those things you can pick up 10 different times and open it and you'll find 10 different things Mm -hmm. But one of the probably most impactful parts about it is that it was designed and illustrated by this British anarchist artist named Clifford Harper. And Clifford Harper, I think, was a big influence both on me and on Alec uh, in, in different ways. He put out a very influential publication called Anarchy, a Graphic Guide, which was almost like a clip art book of anarchist history that hundreds and hundreds of people have you know taken images out of and repurposed and reused on flyers and books and record covers and t-shirts and things like that and he was really a an influential point of entry into how one could be an engaged kind of artist and designer um and do kind of what you want but also work within the context of social movements and publishing houses and 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 um other forms. I mean, he did illustrations for The Guardian for years. So he weaved in and out of both the the kind of ultra left and the mainstream. And I think there are a number of people like that that we have been influenced by. David King, who's another British designer that maybe Alec will talk about or could talk about more. Dia Treyer Moore was a illustrator and designer from Copenhagen and and people like that. Yeah, and because, you know, we are a publication that's focused on art and design, I think art and design are important for us to uh, have look good and have match the context of our stories. Uh, Josh did mention David King, who we brought up last time, uh, who was a English graphic designer who died, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or something, right? Or Last, I think. Last couple of years, I guess, yeah. before COVID, but... Um, who uh, work was kind of ubiquitous in ways that I, you know, once you kind of figured out who he was, you started understanding that there was more and more of your life that things that you liked because uh, how they looked, and they were a lot of them were designed by David King. He was a just great, excellent graphic designer. He was probably most well known for doing the cover of Jimi Hendrix's Electric Ladyland, a bunch of kind of classic rock album covers. And then, you know, in the 70s and 80s, did a lot of the graphic design, not the logo itself, but for Rock Against Racism, a lot of anti-apartheid graphics, and had a very like, Soviet-influenced, kind of bold, colorful, big sans serif uh, type, uh, just kind of beautiful, vibrant work. Uh, and was a historian did book covers for Penguin, uh, tons of graphic design, and a lot of political work. So that was, yeah, definitely a big influence on us as well. Yeah, I mean, the underground press, the like work of Emery Douglas in the Black Panther paper, the graphics that, were, that came out of the AIDS movement in the 80s and 90s, all these things I think were, were influences. And all of them in different ways touched on publishing, whether or not it was in the form of an ongoing publication like the Black Panther newspaper or in the form of kind of serialized broadsheets or flyers like what that came out of uh, ACT UP and and the AIDS movement that like print and publishing has sort of always been central to the forms of aesthetics that we're drawn to. Most, if not all, the stuff covered in Signal is grounded in the uh, physical rather than the digital realm. 
Um, what do you see as the special value of physical media in the digital age? You can touch it. I mean, this this can this question around digital verse or parallel to uh, analog is. I mean, it can go in so many different directions. I think that to keep it contained, to say that I think we're we're just a you know we're the last pre-born digital generation. So both of us were born in a time before there was the expectation that we would be seeing things on a screen. So I think that I mean. To be honest, to just have a nostalgia slash natural kind of orientation towards print, physical print, because it's what I grew up with. It's what I learned to read with. It's it's how I learned to make things. But but beyond that, I think that the reality is is that we can we can take a piece of paper and we can put an image and some text on it and we can throw it onto a copy machine or a risograph or even an inkjet printer. And we have almost total control over what that is, what's on it, how it gets distributed, who sees it. And then the reality with the internet is that there's the illusion of a certain like sort of digital democracy. But the fact of the matter is, is that the, 99 point whatever percent of internet and even social media traffic it all goes through a very 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 small handful of websites that are we don't own or control and so you maybe are lucky and in, in what you make gets seen because of some algorithmic glitch or some gatekeeper lets it through but the reality is is that we just don't own the digital means of reproducing our ideas but we do have the ability to own the analog means. And so maybe it's an old school kind of left argument of like about controlling the means of production, but the physical means of production are much, much more accessible and easier to, to own and, and have some control over and management of. I would just, you know, dovetail on there too. I mean, it, there's definitely room for people who want to do this digitally. I, both Josh and I like print media and, like print media as well but whether or not that is has to be the way it has to be for us it's a way that we can have longer form ideas we can have images i think take up kind of a more i don't say sacred but like have a more impactful space that you engage with more as opposed to just flicking past for other people that might not be true and there's certainly a lot of people out there i mean there's many instagram accounts that i follow that are doing archives of left covers of books and posters and things like that. I mean, lots of stuff like that is out there. And I don't think us being in this lane and us people being in that lane is not, you know, it's synergistic, I hope. Um, and I don't feel like we have to cross over at this point either, which is, you know, maybe at some point it would feel like you had to, but there's plenty of people in the digital space doing archiving, documenting. For us, I think it, as I said, it gives us a chance to really highlight and focus in on some works and some ideas and give it some space. And at least in my particular reading habits and probably people of our generation, people that I know, which are not all of my generation, you know, it, it, it allows a, a kind of a further sense of space and focus on that work. I know people who just read things on their phone and I just couldn't do it. I just don't, it's too distracting and it's too small. Everything looks bad. Might not be the case for everyone. Is that too open minded, you think, Josh? What do you think? No, no, that's good. I mean, I I think that um I would only like I don't I'm not against the digital. I just think that there needs to be a, a little bit more of an open eyed reality check about what it is and what it isn't. And like the vast majority of the internet is a giant graveyard of websites that no one goes to and aren't kept up because there's this promise it's really easy to make a website in reality it's actually quite difficult to maintain one and it's expensive and and publishing in physical form is actually cheaper and it lasts longer right so kind of bring our our discussion to a close 
What do you see as the role of propaganda and movement making? What are the qualities that you think that make it effective? And what do you see as its greatest potential and greatest limitations? Well, I think one thing that we knew going in, I don't think this is new to us, but I think it's uh, something we relearn continually is that there is not a set formula for what makes good propaganda and political movements. It's very unique to the situation, to the artists, to the movement itself, and just to the spirit behind it. So I think there's not necessarily a slam dunk there. But I do think perhaps the, the maybe this is the slam dunk, is that what makes effective propaganda in movements is, pe- is, is when people are involved with the movement or have some kind of basis in that movement. It doesn't have to be with a, necessarily with an organization, but you know, a long time coming in that movement. I remember there was a long time ago before Signal existed, I, Josh and I lived together in Chicago and there was a, um, I don't know, you were doing a presentation on a wheat pasting campaign. And, and I think the idea at the time was that people there could go and learn how to do this and go out and do it right away. And the reality is, is that, I, I don't even remember what this, but I think it was about prison or something, but you know, Josh had spent a number of years involved in prison abolition movements, had made art with people and had developed relations with people and got a crew out to go out and do this action. It's not, um, rarely is it something you can just kind of do on the spot and have be effective. I think there's um, so much work in the background of doing effective cultural work. And some of that work is just, you know, spending time in the movement and in the community. And I said, it's not necessarily about being in a specific organization. So to me, that is oftentimes what we cover are people who have been thoughtful about their work and their communities and the movements that matter to them and, and take some creative approaches to going about it and pivoting when things aren't working and um, having happy accidents when things do. Yeah, the, the propaganda or agitprop overlap with sort of fine art traditions and, and design, commercial design, but they're not the same thing. They have their own concerns and their own needs. And those some of those are relatively universal and some of those are movement specific. And I think that uh, part of what I hope that Signal can do is it can kind of help illuminate that this is a unique tradition. And that while it's not completely separate from the things that we call art or the things that we call design, to, to think about it as its own territory really helps from the perspective of makers and of movements to, 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 to make better agitprop, to realize that there are things that are really useful, that like making material that people are familiar with so it's easy for them to pick it up and sort of take some ownership over it is often more powerful than something that's like brand new which is like very different than if you're doing commercial design work and you want to make you're you know trying to sell a new product or you're doing fine art and it's all about like newness then in fact newness is not necessarily the best thing when you're doing agitprop like doing things that are collectively produced is often quite difficult when you're working in the terrain of fine art or commercial design, but within movements, it, it tends to help generate senses of collective authorship and ownership. And those multiple voices adding in can really <clears throat> speak to the different elements and aspects of people who are part of an organization or a movement or a group that's trying to do something. And so there's just different concerns and by sort of putting to the foreground lots of different examples and the ways that people have negotiated and engaged with these questions, I think that we just hope that that will be helpful and useful for people that are continuing to do that into the future. Okay. I think that I have what I need. Thank you again for taking the time to do this again. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no worries. This is the Final Straw Radio, and you just heard Ian's conversation with Josh McPhee and Alec Dunn, co-editors of Signal Journal and members of the Just Seeds Artist Cooperative. 
on issue number eight, which is just out from PM Press. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Kite Line is a weekly 30-minute radio program focusing on issues in the prison system. You'll hear news along with stories from prisoners and former prisoners as well as their loved ones. You'll learn what prison is, how it functions, and how it impacts all of us. Behind the prison walls, a message is called a kite. Whispered words, a note passed hand to hand, a request submitted to the guards for medical care. Illicit or not, sending a kite means trusting that other people will bear it farther along until it reaches its destination. Here on Kite Line, we hope to share these words across the prison walls. You can hear us on the Channel Zero Network and find out more at kitelineradio.noblogs.org. Now you'll hear part of an interview I conducted with M. Walimu Shakur, an incarcerated new African revolutionary socialist in California about education, abolition, and other topics. If you want to support The Final Straw Radio, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow, rate, and share our materials online, and learn more at tfsr.wtf. And if you'd like to fund our transcription work that allows for easier translation, more accessibility of content, and the zines that we produce from each interview, consider picking up some merch from us or making a one-time or recurring donation via PayPal, Venmo, Stripe, or LibrePay. Or joining our Patreon to access early release content and other goodies via the links that you can find at tfsr.wtf slash support. Uh, yeah, so we've spoken before, but I wonder if you wouldn't mind um, reminding listeners your name, uh, your location, any sort of like information about you that would sort of set the stage for this this chat. Well, my name is Imwan Limu Shakur, and I am in the belly of the beast known as Corcoran State Prison, home of the first security housing unit, SHU. And uh, being back in the general population, you know, having to rebuild and restructure uh, things going on in this camp has not been easy, but it's a challenge world. Welcomed, you know, being a freedom fighter that I am, uh, understanding what needs to be done, uh, me and other comrades of like mine, we welcome it. So that's what I'm doing until they unleash these gates and allow me to walk out of here and re-enter society where I can help with the movement that's going on out there. The last time we spoke, you talked about how a lot of the work that you're doing in there is study and discussion and, and, and sharpening those tools. And I know, like, in, over the last few years, there's been a lot of chatter at various levels, like, whether it be even in, like, mainstream society around the concept of abolition. And people have been talking about abolitionism for a very long time with different definitions of of what that movement is and what that phrase means. So I wonder if you could um, sort of bust into what, the term abolition means to you? Well, for, for me and others of like mine on the inside, abolition means to destroy, you know, this system, you know, from hitting them from the inside out as well as from the outside in. But you have to wake up the minds of those in society so they can understand how to do that, or they'll fall into the gap of reform. You know, they'll try to make the system better by coming up with laws to change it and, and want to follow certain rules in order to get those laws changed. And you, you can't do that. You have to tear this system down and then rebuild another one that works for the people. Because when people are oppressed, they're not just oppressed by one front, like an economic front. And this system, they oppress us on all fronts, political fronts. They use their military apparatus to keep us in control. You know, they oppress us with this prison system, you know, where it teaches you how to be a slave to it, you know, because your labor they're exploiting in here economically and politically, just like they're doing in society. So you have to understand that, and, and that's the importance of, of us providing these re-education classes, which teaches you how to abolish the system by challenging the conditions and having a new system in place once you do that. So that's that's the bulk of what we do on a daily basis, because if you teach the people how to understand what's going on, they can come up with their own unique uh, strategies and tactics to reach that objective. So, you know, it's a challenge in and of itself, but, yeah, that's what that's what abolition means to me, and, and that's, you know, one of the ways I see in which that we can accomplish that through our re-education. I wonder if you could say some words about the historical context of like, as a new African revolutionary, if you could speak about, like, the context of abolition and the legacy of abolition and where the movement, 
using that phrase now kind of stands in terms of that. The continuation of like from abolition of, of slavery through the abolition of Jim Crow or any of these systems that have like sort of popped up. Um, like as Michelle Alexander kind of like talked about in her book, the like one thing after another, you like uh, a depressive system comes up, a change occurs that that causes like a shift that makes it impossible for it to function in the same way that it had before. And there being the sort of resumption of those oppressions under a new name and under like a slightly different, different framework. Is that that sort of reform that you're talking about? Yes, yes, yes. And you see it clearly because like, like, like you just made mention of from slavery, they went from to Jim Crow. Okay. From Jim Crow, they went to the system you see now with, with, the, put the prison industrial slave complex. They practice the same things within these systems, but they change things around so that people will be uh, uh, led to believe that they've given you the change that you've desired. And that's no, no, that's not the case. You know what I mean? Because when you le- left the clauses in the amendments, the 13th and 14th amendments, you could continue to utilize these same practices. You just like when like like. It's smoke and mirrors, okay? By changing the name, you also change the face of it, okay? And nothing has changed, but people sometimes believe that it has, so they have hope, and they go along with certain things, while other things on the other side are getting worse. Take, for example, when you so-called free to slaves. Well, if that was true, then why were slavery practices still being done in Texas? You know, and then a couple of years later, people recognize that they're now free. You know, you kept that, the same system in place. You just changed the names of certain things. You let slaves free in the South, but if you caught them with no place to go, then you put them into a jail with a make-believe court system. You established the police department, okay, which justified your way of doing that. And you, you call it the convict lease program, which puts some back into the plantation on you know, whoever owns it to practice the same things legally. You see what I'm saying? So there was no change in the system. So getting people to understand that is the hard part because people will become complacent because the class that the one percent class that's a person throws other things out there to distract you so that you don't see what they're doing behind closed doors. You know what I mean? Like how they got people distracted now with this materialism. You know? They got you thinking that if you do the things that they want you to do, like going to the avenues of the entertainment game or sports, that, you know, you'll be successful when all, in all actuality, all you're doing is giving the money right back to them by buying their houses, buying their cars, buying their clothes. You don't see that they're still oppressing you and they're still controlling you by way of this system, you know. So that's the whole concept of getting people to see that nothing's changed. You know, so in the last couple of years too, with within the framework of discussing abolition versus reform, I've heard a lot of people talk about non-reformist reforms, as in things that can be done through the legal system to mitigate the harm that people are suffering in the immediate, in hopes that releasing that chokehold will allow people the space and capacity to be able to resist further. I guess, like, as as one of the organizers and resistors from the widespread hunger strikes a little over a decade ago in the California system, following that, people challenged through courts, and I think some of that's still going through the courts, but some of the circumstances that kept people in solitary confinement for such long times without the ability to challenge that is in your mind, is there a thing such as a non-reformist reform, or does it all kind of get fed back into the system? And and if you wouldn't mind talking a little bit about that experience of the direct action hunger strikes that you all were taking and court battles afterwards and how those relate. Well, the struggle, because the struggle continues and it's not over, you do have to find little ways within the system to work. To uh, and, and there are strategies and tactics that you use to reach an objective, but you use it and you don't, stop you got to keep going you know what i mean so we found ways within the system to you know cause a stir you know by the hunger strike and but we we did we knew we weren't gonna have to, we weren't gonna settle for that we we're gonna also attack the courts 
You know, we were also going to mobilize people in society to form organizations around these same needs to challenge these conditions that we're facing. And waking them up to see what's really going on by educating them, they've seen it. You know what I mean? So you do find those ways to make things happen, but you can't settle for that. And that's where people go wrong because they believe if they if they look at reform as a good thing, they'll settle for doing things that way. And then when the enemy comes with a counterattack, they won't be prepared to fend that off because they'll they'll stop thinking about abolition and only focus on that that reform that you were talking about. You know. So what we are continuing to do is practice what Ho Chi Minh talked about when the War of the Flea. You know, when he goes against the enemy, it's like a flea attacking a tiger. It bites him in all different places and worries him to where the tiger can't recover, and it has to run in the forest, you know, to try to find some type of of a tree to rub against or, or some type of relief by jumping in the water or something, you know what I mean, to stop this flea from attacking him. Well, that's what the people have to do to this system in order to get complete abolition. You have to attack all the fronts, economic, political, the justice system, you know, uh, come together culturally, you know, socially. And by doing this, you're able to get more relief in those areas you didn't think you could get relief in. And it caused you to not settle and not be complacent. So the hunger strike, the momentum that it gained, we just went with that, you know. And it allowed some people to get their, their freedoms back into society where they can do some work in the community, create self-sufficiency programs, uh, join some of those organizations and, and work in the legal field or in, in other cultural ways, other, you know, create businesses that help people get into the public school system and push the literature in there that we was reading and study that helps you overcome these certain types of things and, you know, just continue to, to rebuild and use that momentum to cause you to keep fighting and keep going, you know, so... That, like I said, so that you don't become complacent. So you, you do use those avenues, and, and they work to a certain extent, but you've got to keep going. You know, you've got to keep going because you can't get abolition if you don't, you know, and, and that's the main objective. Um, so in terms of abolition, understanding that people harm each other and that people have safety concerns, some people are a bit frightened by the concept of, of abolition or think it's naive to think of a world without police, maybe because they, they think of police as serving the purpose of keeping communities safe. But I wonder if you had thoughts about how do we imagine and develop an abolitionist approach to community safety minus cops and prisons and without just reproducing the same methods and institutions under a different name um, that would have the same sort of result. Well, first of all, the people would have to realize that creating your own organizations, they're self-governing, and they have rules, you know, that people have to subordinate themselves to. And within doing so, you, begin, you, you, you develop the discipline that you need in order to carry out organizations' work, which could be self-sufficiency programs and other type of talent that you bring out of people so that they'll feel more appreciative and forthcoming to what's going on in the new society. And, and there won't be a uh, crime or malicious intent from people because you're holding them accountable of those rules and those regulations. So, you know, in a way, it's, you're, it, it's your, you're policing yourselves because you can also uh, create a people's police department. You know what I mean? That holds people accountable for breaking type of those rules. You know, and then you hand out, you know, disciplinary punishments for that type of thing. You know, I think that if people had more programs, um, you had help for whatever type of chemical imbalances that you may have, um, and you were provided the right types of medication, you wouldn't have crime. You know, crime is usually produced by people who are considered the underclass because the rich holds all the power. You know, and even in if you watch, like, TV shows like the cartoon Robin Hood, you see that the rich had all the power. And the poor people were stealing from the rich in order to have basic necessities. So when, when you have those things that happen, then, you know, you have to recreate things in order to, in, in order to have a complete society. Yeah, so um, that's funny. I, was, I guess this is like the, the line of thought that we're 
worth um, moving on, both of us. But whether you're at Corcoran or in North Carolina or wherever, the systems of power that exist that use the language of, of justice and safety, you know, while they're getting their paychecks and while they're driving around our communities, there, there is a degree to which a lot of people in our communities invest trust in those words or say it's like the best that we've got. I wonder if there are any examples you wouldn't mind talking about or you can talk about where you've seen people shift the ground and choose choose the rules that they follow, um, communicate about that directly and sort of take the the power to some degree out of the hands of the so-called authorities and, and build community power. Does that make sense? Well, yeah, we're doing that now. You know, when people come together, um, like for us New Africans, we study our history, okay, and we practice our culture, okay? Mexicans will do the same thing, okay? And when you have the whites who believe in this Aryan way of living, okay, they're not portraying their hate on us, and they're not disrespecting us verbally. They're practicing their way of life. Okay, and, you know, some of them are oldness and go to those types of services where they're worshiping, I guess, Satan or some type of uh, being other than, you know, the God of all creation. And, you know, that's their way of life. That's their, their thing, you know. People stay in their own little groups. And, when, like I said, if there is any type of form of disrespect, no matter how it is, we're going to try to neutralize that situation before it gets out of hand, before it goes to all-out violence. So we do that amongst ourselves. Now, let's say we're all being mistreated and disrespected by staff. Well, well we're all going to come together, you know what I mean, like we did in our hunger strike, and say, you know what, we're not eating. You know, and if they try to pop the doors like they did as if we're going to attack each other, we stand armed and armed, linked up. We're not going to be violent. You know what I mean? So that was a way of taking the power out of their hands. You know what I mean? And not letting them interfere in our business, you know, allows us to take the power back from them, creating our own, like I said, our own communities on the inside. We got our own economic system with the socialism, so that way if you give a brother a, a disciplinary write-up for, you know, not locking it up on time or you want to ransack his cell and not put it back in a, you know, a, a, a respectful manner in which you left it, and he files a 602 on you for that. And, you know, you want to try to retaliate by always searching his cell. Okay, you're going to stop that because before he gets violent and attacks you, we're going to come together and have a sit down and we're not going to lock it up until the sergeant comes over here. We're going to address that issue and then we're going to put another 602 on that officer, get him removed from the building for that type of disrespect. You know, anytime you take from us uh, something that we hold dear, which is like our little bit of program that we get, we're going to retaliate in a meaningful way. You know, not in a violent way, but in a meaningful way where we can talk about it and dialogue and have a, a discussion about what's going on because now you're hindering and infringing on our time. When you get to go home, we don't. Some of us, this is our home for a long period of time. You know what I mean? So we know how to neutralize situations and come together. And, and um, that takes the power out of their hand because if they can't move, if they can't move you, in a, and, and cause you to violence so they can retaliate in a more violent way, which causes them to place you in solitary confinement, give you new charges and things of that nature, then they lose the battle. Yeah, so you and I had spoken about this book, um, Chronicle of a Prison Dirty War. Is that the right title? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, and it goes through the experiences of a black political revolutionary prisoner. I don't know if – I actually don't know if the author identifies as New African to, does he? Should I correct that? Yeah, yeah. He's a new African freedom fighter. He's an elder. Okay. But talking about the creation of both the bolstering of white gangs, the racialization, like the further racialization of those white gangs inside of the California prison system coming up through the 60s and 70s, and then like the vying through the creation of the prison economy by administration and by the guards of different sets and different communities against each other. Uh, within the California system, and it feels like the hunger strikes that you participated in falls into this long line of instances where what has been called by some or what was called by the folks during the Lucasville uprising as the prison class, the unification is like a common right. understanding of 
a shared situation that even though some groups had an immediate like leg up over the other groups, that everyone was still locked into the same sort of cages at the end of the day. And one of the strengths of those prison st- of those hunger strikes that you participated in were that it was people from so many different communities as well as different sets, if they engaged in that, unifying basically against the common circumstances that they were experiencing in a way that right, you know right. spread like wildfire and the state of California could not deal with it. It spread outside of the state. Yeah. It spread up the coast. It spread to places in Canada. But I wonder if you could yeah. speak about the potential of that sort of thing, like both inside or outside of the prison system. Well, that's what we need. You know, we once you recognize you have a common enemy, you know, everybody can come together in solidarity and challenge your condition. That was just the way we chose to do so. Hunger strike and then put out a mandate saying that we agree to end all our hostilities because we know what, what started our hostilities, like what the elders spoke of in the book. In those days, you know, it was a racial time in society, you know, to whereas Pro was in full effect and FBI was attacking revolutionaries, you know, all class, I mean, in our class struggle, all, all social classes, you know, and on the inside, you have the white supremacist ideology group where they also put that, those types of, of COs in, in the prison. You know, they weren't hiring like blacks and Mexican prisoners. I mean, prison guards. So you have the white supremacist ideology prison guards in here. So now when you put blacks in here, which was, you know, second, you know, to the, to the whites and then became the majority, we're faced with all types of racial oppression. You know what I mean? As he, you know, clearly was was talking about, and they had to come together in unity to challenge that. You know, and what was what was intriguing is that a lot of people didn't know that the FBI created these institutional structures as well that are government agencies, the the SSU and the IGI and the ISU. You know, those are federal agencies that work inside the prison, and they only target social classes of inmates. You know what I mean? So once you go to war, there's no time to stop and ask questions about why it would happen. You know what I mean? It's just all full-out war. And in order to curb that war, they were putting everybody in solitary confinement, you know, killing the head, thinking that the bodies would die. So that way the wars continued to happen in the general population. And after so so long of that, they create the shoe and start putting people, you know, buried alive in there for for generations on generations. And, you know, when you understand, like I said, the conditions, you have to let others know, look, this is what we face, this is why we face it. Here's a solution. What do you, what do you have? And then somebody have pitched their solution. Somebody have pitched their solution. And then here come a strategy. And next you know, he goes some other tactics that they can use to complement that strategy. And it, it works when you keep the objective at the core front of your mind because we cannot stop until we achieve this, you know, and that's what made it so enjoyable. We was able to see a way out. We was able to make understand why it was important for us to achieve this. And we kept, you know, doing what we needed to do to get there. You know, I, I wasn't one of the leaders in, in, in that movement. I just followed suit. You know what I mean? So I can't take the credit for none of that. But my elders, you know, they, they are very sharp and talented individuals. They have strong minds. You know, I thank them for instilling such strong disciplinary principles inside myself because without them, I would I don't know where I would be. I mean, my education came from them, you know, them long hours of studying and reading and, and, and continuing to read and study and writing essays about what I learned and how to show it in my practice and going through ideological struggles so that I can, you know, transform my mind and become the new man that I am, you know, is only because my elders had the foresight to see what kind of beauty we could have at the end if we continue up with this fight. Yeah, that's that's really beautiful to to like point to the elders and and you continue that legacy by bringing in younger folks and sharing the knowledge and the experiences that you have um which I think is great. So Emilimu, I was wondering uh there's some pretty good news about your your release is getting it's getting closer. Um can you tell the audience a bit about like when you're due out and what your plans are for when you get out? Well, yeah, I'm due out according to this Prop 57, which is a board that they have absent you to you, but it, it acts just like the regular parole board for those who have a life sentence for them to be considered 
released back into society. And for us who have a non-violent sentence, it allows us to go to the board before our actual release date to get out early. And in my case, they waited to the last minute, which my re release date is in December, a month before my parole board hearing, which is in November. So even though it's only 30 days, I would still like it to, to pass, uh, and I'm thankful for it. If it does, if not, I'm still thankful that I'll be getting out here soon. And uh, within the next few months, plans are to reenter society and, and get into the workforce. I'm a paralegal by trade, and as well as a practicing journalist. So, I, And then finding work is not going to be too hard for me. Um, I have other skills that I can utilize, and I know a few people who can help me navigate through, you know, the job market and whatnot. But I'm planning on working with community organizations and bringing the transformative programs to the inner city communities. Uh, of course, I'll be in I'll be in Los Angeles, my hometown, for at least a year until I get off parole, and I'm hoping that once I do, I'll be able to travel to other states, to these other cities and uh, see what kind of problems exist and try to help those who are doing something about fixing those problems, working with them in solidarity. Yeah, that's awesome. And you mentioned that you've, I mean, you're a journalist. And I'm sure, like, as as a paralegal, yeah, you're right, you'll, and with your experience, like, I'm sure you'll be able to find a lot of opportunities. And you've been publishing writing recently with a, a Los Angeles-based uh, online publication, right? Could you talk about that, maybe name it, where people can find your writing? Uh, yeah, Knock LA. Knock LA. I got some uh, comrades over there, my boy Chris, my boy Joey. Um, yeah, I've been working with them. Um, I also did, I think I, I think the first time I told somebody I was paroling with, with Tight Line, my friend Mia over there. But, uh, yeah, working with them has been a pleasure. They, You know, people want to know about how we, you know, made it in the shoe for so long, how the transition has been since we've gotten out the shoe. So that was the last uh, piece of work that I how can people follow your writing on social media? I, I think there's some folks that are running uh, pages for you, right? Yeah, yeah, I have an Instagram. Uh, it's at New African Revolutionary. You can find me there. You can find me at Revolutionary Internationalism. And my fiance has a, a, a Facebook page, uh, Freedom Looks Good on Us. And she's also a brilliant, brilliant person. She's a strong woman. She's been, you know, rebuilding her life since she's been out of prison, you know, she works for CCWP, California Coalition for Women's Prisoners, and Lisa is remarkable with the work that she she does, and we'll be collaborating on projects once I get free as well. Yeah, that's awesome. I look forward to learning more about her and finding some of her work out there. Well, cool. I'm Olimu. Thank you so much for having this conversation and, and for your efforts, and uh, I'm excited for your release. I uh, really appreciate, you know, all the help you've been there for me, Burst. And the work that you do and the work that, you know, I look forward to doing with you when I get out there. And, yeah, can't wait to get out into this society and uh, continue this good work. It's always a yeah. pleasure. Always Thanks a pleasure on this side, too. Really Thanks, comrade. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. Brian Wickensheimer goes by Adam, his middle name. He's a Swifty married to a Swifty. So he and his wife, Kristen, waited with bated breath as Taylor Swift tickets went on sale. They managed to get into the first sale of tickets for Taylor's concert at Paycor Arena in downtown Cincinnati and got tickets, get this, for the front row. They were both ecstatic, but also concerned because Adam's in a wheelchair. He's paraplegic, and that means he needs special seating, a space slightly wider than most able-bodied people. So when Kristen specified the need for reserved seating under the Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, Ticketmaster told her to get with Paycor. Paycor Arena told her to let them know the day of the concert. So everything was good, right? Well, it should have been. Paycor is obligated to set aside 1% of seats for ADA seating. And if you look at graphs and charts for just about any concert venue, you'll note that to make that quota of seating, every venue sets aside the seats at the ends of the rows and counts those seats as ADA seats. So given this, Adam and Kristen knew that worst case scenario, they'd be moved from somewhere near the middle of the front row to somewhere at the end of it. No big deal. Then... Days before the concert, 
Paycor changed their policy. On their website, they announced that they would not be permitting wheelchairs into the stadium unless the person in the wheelchair had a specified ADA seat. Big problem. Remember, ADA seats had not even gone on sale when Adam and Kristen got their tickets. They didn't even have the option of buying ADA seating. And now Adam's use of his wheelchair was dependent on having ADA seats that weren't even available to him to buy. Initially, Paycor indicated that they would be chaining wheelchairs to the bike rack. No kidding. So Adam, who has PTSD, was put into the stressful situation of trying to decide how to proceed. He knew the concert was important to Kristen, and he didn't want to sell the tickets. But he required his wheelchair to get to his seat. He can't use his legs to get there, and unless Paycor owns a really accurate catapult, he had no plan to get from the bike rack all the way to his seat in the front row. Adam decided he was going to crawl. He would simply pull himself across the floor to get there, perhaps wearing a T-shirt that said, This is how Paycor thanks paralyzed veterans. He'd have Kristen film the whole thing. He shared his plans online, and attorneys came out of the woodwork. A Cincinnati news team interviewed him and Kristen, and you can check out those stories by searching Brian Wickensheimer and Concert Access. Then, Paycor changed their policies. I'm not sure who Paycor's lawyers are, but their names ought to be publicly disclosed so no one accidentally hires these buffoons for important legal stuff. They're so dumb they thought their policies were ADA compliant, chaining wheelchairs to bike racks and making people crawl to their seats until media showed up. The problem is that wheelchairs take up about an extra foot of space, and Paycor was finding ways to cram in extra seating at a thousand bucks a seat. They didn't want to subtract space for wheelchairs. It's all about profiteering. Also, while ADA requires Paycor to set aside 1% of seats for ADA accommodation, they had actually set aside only a small fraction of that, and those seats had not gone on sale at the beginning of the purchasing. When Adam and Kristen got to the concert venue on the day of the show, they had to find their own way to their seats, taking a freight elevator down to the floor, only because a janitor tipped them off to the elevator. The only ADA-accessible bathroom within a reasonable distance had a sign, Staff Only. Adam couldn't get to the middle of the row and called over Paycor staff. He suggested that they move to the end of the row, you know, since it's designated ADA seating anyway. Paycor didn't want to do that, didn't want to displace whoever had the, the aisle seats and push them to the middle, as that wouldn't be fair. Instead, what made sense to them was moving Adam and Kristen back about 40 rows to an ADA section. Paycor didn't want to inconvenience those people at the end of the row, but they clearly had no qualms about inconveniencing the guy in the wheelchair. When Adam and Kristen arrived at the ADA section, he was the only one there in a wheelchair. Everyone around them was able-bodied teens or their able-bodied parents. All of them had bought ADA tickets. That's right. You don't need proof of a disability to buy ADA tickets. You've got to have a sticker on your license plate to take up a handicapped parking spot, but you need nothing to scoop up $1,000 ADA tickets and displace the people who need them, essentially pushing those people who need the tickets out of the public domain. And I'm not trying to pick on Paycor here. Paycor is not some bad apple in the midst of a batch of otherwise good apples. It starts with Ticketmaster, who can't be sued because it has its own paid mediator that you must solicit rather than going to court. And it ends with every single concert venue cramming in more seats to make more money. To borrow a phrase, we're talking about a whole basket of deplorables. Corporate profiteers who would make paralyzed concert goers crawl from the bike rack to their seats if no one was filming it. That's what access looks like under 21st century capitalism. 
Adam plans to change that. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at seanswain.org. This is The Final Straw Radio. The show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at TFSR, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books. Located at 1022 Haywood Road in West Asheville, Firestorm Books is a worker-owned cooperative in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events at their website, firestorm.coop. 